Siba. Um, so my talk is about the first, not really the first, maybe the first two Soviet generations. Um, and it's something I've wanted to talk about for a long time because um, it's inspired a little bit by my grandfather, who I, I think is a good example of the um, paranoid, uh, self, self surveillancing Soviet personality. This is a man who, in his Brooklyn apartment, still has like McDougal as on his on his buzzer because if anyone needs to find him, they'll know where he is. That's his <laughs> attitude about things. But um, he has what? He has what? Well, you know, he lives in Brooklyn and it has oh, all McDougal. the names on the things, oh. but he um, he I goes see. by a different name it, it, to everybody. Now the, the hostages, when they call up, they call him Moisha. Some people call him Nissel, some people call him Nikolai. So he has multiple identities. And I think he was in the party, and I think he survived by adapting like this. So I've always wanted to do a, 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 a talk on how people came to become like this. So, but the first question I have, yes. And I just wanted to show my badge. It's like, see, I have Sasha here. Right. I have Alexander here, and Alexander here. So that's exactly what she's talking about. <laughs> yeah, but you're not Alexander with Google. <laughs> you know, but but it's, or it's, Campbell. I mean, you have, to, you have to do stuff like that because people, you know, respect yeah. you to your doubt. And is your point about McDougal is that he doesn't want to appear to be Jewish? Or no, no, no. He just doesn't it? want people to, you know, to know where he is, what he's doing. Every, he, he, he doesn't Plus need anyone analysis. knowing more than they have to. It's on, everything's on a need-to-know basis with, this, with my grandpa. But oh, while, while I, before I, he's, um, he's 82. <coughs> but I wanted to ask those of you who went through the American educational system, how many of you took the SATs? Okay, great, great. Um, and how many of you took a prep, prep class for the SATs? You guys are smart, because I took a prep class. <laughs> didn't have prep classes. You didn't? Yeah. Did you study yeah. for them? I mean, did your parents push you? We were told not to. We were told yeah. studying would not help you. Right? This is a That's smart true. bunch of Jews, because I don't know. I mean, everybody I know studied for them. But um, I, I did take a prep course, and my parents pushed me into it. And I wanted to bring it up to, just to give you guys kind of an SAT prep story from 1938. Uh, something similar, and um, in uh, in 1938, my grandmother, whose name was Italia, was living in uh, a fairly big uh, town, small city in the Ukraine called Korostin. Uh But she had <coughs> cousins living in. Are you? Do you know the Yes, he's my my Are you kidding me? That's where I was born. Oh, yeah, Korostin. Korostin, yeah. Okay. Oh, you know. Geekmans. I'm sure my mother does. <laughs> George geography, you <laughs> <laughs> Well, she had relatives who were living in a very small town um, of Lipniki, which was about uh, an hour, uh, an hour north, I think. And this town had um, mostly Ukrainians, not enough Jews to even justify having a Jewish school there. So, um, so, oh no, I'm sorry. She was living in Lipniki. And, then, and she had her cousins were living in this big town, and um, in 1938, uh, her aunt Nahama uh, Shapiro, um, one of her daughters was already married, but the other two were still were still in school, and she decided to take them out of the Yiddish school in this big town that had cultural life and everything, and put them in this tiny little village school in this deaf. Uh, town of Livniki that had very few other Jews, but where her brother was living with his family. So these girls moved in with their uncle and his family and, and completed their education um, at this Ukrainian school. Now, why why would um, a religious woman living in a, a big town with a large Jewish population do this? Well, you have to think about what was happening at that time. Um, Jews were suddenly offered new educational opportunities and in order to take advantage of them, they had to be able to pass their college entrance exams in the dominant language, which would have been Russian or Ukrainian. <clears throat> and um, there were, of course, Russian schools in this big town, uh, Ukrainian schools in this big town, but it, it was probably a little bit like, come join us. Okay. Um, it was probably a little bit like uh, school districts here, that it wouldn't be that simple to take your kid out of um, the the school district, which had these Yiddish secular schools, because remember, the headers had all been closed, I think, by 1932. 
so this these would have been um, these would have been um, secular Yiddish language schools, and um, just to you know to have them go to a Ukrainian school in that same town. So so the, the the way that she was going to get her daughters to get their Ukrainian up to par to be able to take the college entrance exams was to send them to this to this small um, village, and um, I'll get back to so one of her one of her daughters did indeed apply to the University of Lviv, um, passed that had a hard time passing this exam because she kept translating in her head from the Yiddish, um, forgot the word for I, you know, so, but ended up going to the university. But I'll get back to her later, and, and I want to go kind of rewind a little bit to talk about what would have happened in the society to have made a religious woman do this. Um, well, let's see. We have people who probably are better versed in, in Russian history than I, than I am. But we all know what happened between 1917 and 1923, right? right. Okay. Um, so at the, the Jews um, were at first enthusiastic about toppling the, the collapse of, um, of the Tsarist government, which is not the same thing as saying that they were enthusiastic about the Bolsheviks. Before, between when um, the, the Tsarist government uh, collapsed and the provisional government and the Bolsheviks, you had a lot of different, you had a lot of different uh, parties and a lot of different movements. And <clears throat> this has been sort of forgotten because by 1923 the Bolsheviks had consolidated their power. And what, what we know of the Bolsheviks is that they did not really tolerate a plurality of opinions. So, um, what were some of the groups that, that would have uh, that the, G the Jews might have belonged to in um, in 1917? Right. The Bund. The Bund, big one, right? right? Um, but unlike unlike Mensheviks, for instance, the Bund was absorbed. It was not it was not destroyed. It was absorbed. It was absorbed and destroyed. It was split. Uh, it, it was they murdered split. people. Uh, they murdered just a few. <laughs> but no, seriously, the, the history of, of Bund is very different from the history of Menshevik or, or from history of SRs, so-called SRs. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is because SRs were com uh, officially considered terrorists and been openly persecuted, while people from Bund were given an opportunity to join if they kind of drop some some of their crazy ideas, mm -hmm. which most most of them did, and just a few most hardcore. Uh, people were, were persecuted, so it is different, and, and that is why there was such a huge predominance of Jews in uh, among the, of the Bolsheviks on the, on a very top level. They many of them came from Bund. Well, the Bund, you named uh, several of the groups, which is good. I mean, right. We had the Sere, the Mensheviks, the Bund, right? And the, the Bund had an interesting history, which which I won't go into too deeply, but. Um, it split at some point, and half of, went to the left wing to sing the international. The other half went to sing the. Um, they had their own anthem, which was what it, I forgot the. Um, yeah, the shvua. And um, in fact, they had in people within the Bund who were um, undermining it from inside, and then you also had it, uh, the Bolsheviks were also repressing it from the outside, but um, and pretty early on. These other parties were being um, were, were being repressed. Zionism was another one that that um, that had a lot, had a lot of uh, popularity because remember this was a time of um, um, the Balfour Declaration, uh, so there was excitement about that as well. And the Zionist Congress was um, its members were arrested again by the Bolsheviks. So. By 1923, there was already um, the Bolsheviks were pretty much coming to um, power. Now there were a lot of Jews among them, right? You had Trotsky, Kamenev, Zinoviev, but that didn't make a big difference to um, to you know the regular Jews living in the shtetls. Um, the only really official Jewish sec uh, Jewish group that survived was Yevsek, which was the Jewish section of um, of the official Communist Party. Anyway. So, but there was something that eventually drove Jews into the hands of the Bolsheviks, who were about atheists. Um, and what, what was that? W what do you think would have driven the Jews into the arms of the Bolsheviks? Um, 